the Saints put up 43 though. So much for that number one defensive Redskins head, huh? It is October the 9th of 2018. Leif Erikson Day. Or what will be known as Majab Day. More on that. So early in February, right? One of them paper, the Washington Examiner. Yeah, I know about the Washington Examiner. Them, one of those propaganda-filled Republican papers. Excuse me. And this was an article on February the 21st of 2018 by someone named Paul Bedard. And the and. And the, the title is, it is titled Washington Secrets MS-13 Spreads to 22 States Fed by 300,000 Illegals, DACA Recipients Tied to 207 Murders. So, conservatives, Republicans pretty much know which, which news sources they need to go to, you know what I mean, to get their news from. And these news sources know that their, their people come to them to get the news sources. So, you know, that's why they like to dumb down their, their reports, dumb it down really, really good, and try not to use too many big words, try to simplify and put it in a way where they can, their they, targeted readers can just get out the points they need. I mean, like it says, MS-13 spreads to 22 states fed by 300,000 illegals, DACA recipients tied to 207 murders. You got to remember around February, there was a lot of, there was big talk going on with the whole, with the Dreamers, DACA recipients and all that. And let's see here. The vicious MS-13 gang stifled under former President George W. Bush exploded during the Obama era fueled by 300,000 illegals. See that? Like I told you, man, they know how to go. Like it, like it says, stifled under Republican Judge W. Bush, exploded under President Barack Obama. We already know that's a lie because earlier we were talking about how Obama deported about 30-something thousand illegals a month during his presidency. So, yeah, you know. Exploded during the Obama era fueled by 300,000 illegals, including those given amnesty under the DACA program. First of all, that's bullshit, but you know. And now has been linked to crimes in 22 states, according to a new report. Since 2012, let me hear what this white boy told you. Aye, Habib. Now you're really my super favorite Mexican, my super favorite Russian of all time, because now I know what what that little racist white boy said to you for you to jump over the octagon and do what you do. You know what I mean? But you know, this is America, so and you have a name like Habib, so they're gonna they're not gonna give a fuck about what was done to provoke you. You know? Welcome to America, bro. Your Russian status don't mean shit. You still got a name like Habib. And you know what's so funny? When the racist white folks say that, that's how they say it. So Habib. Habib. Since 2002, 207 murders have been tied to the gang called Mara Salvatroka. And there are over 500 cases nationwide of MS-13 members being charged in major crimes, according to the reports from the Center for Immigration Studies. But it can sometimes be hard to deport the illegals involved because about half of the crimes detailed in the report occurs in so-called sanctuary cities that do not cooperate with the U.S. ICE, with ICE agents. You know what I mean? Like, they are literally throwing in all the cold words in here. You see how simple this article has been compared to most of the other, the other articles that I've read? President Trump has pledged to crack down on the gang and deport those in the United States illegally. And, and report... And report author Jessica Vaughn suggested that it can't happen soon enough. 
detailing how the gang rebuilt itself under Obama's open door immigration policy. See? Now they know Obama did not have an open door immigration policy. Now, Paul, who wrote this article, he knows that. Like, he knows that, but his fans could care less. His readers could care less. The people who, 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 who read their shit could actually care less. You know what I mean? But at the same time, though, it is what it is. They don't care about spreading lies. They just care that the people are going to read their lies and buy into it. You know what I mean? Detailing how the gang rebuilt itself under Obama's open door immigration policy, she said, this resurgence represents a very serious threat to public safety in communities where MS-13 has rebuilt itself. The resurgence is directly connected to the illegal arrival and, re and resettlement of more than 300,000 Central American youth and families that has continued unabated for six years, and to a deprioritization of Im immigration enforcement in the interior of the country that occurred at the same time. The research she supervised at the immigration think tank found that MS-13 concentration were in areas where so-called unaccompanied alien children were put under Obama, including Virginia, California, Maryland, and New York. <laughs> he listed the three most liberal states and the one state, Virginia, that's been conservative for millennia, for generations, and Virginia is slowly been turning around. Virginia has been coming around slowly in the four years before Obama and in the eight years since Obama, you know what I mean? Because there are a lot of people coming up in Virginia realizing that they have been raised, they have been raised this, their whole life to believe that black folks are inferior, but they're really not, you know what I mean? So the tide is changing. That's why they put Virginia here. So that way they can get anybody living in Virginia who's Republican, who, who supports Trump, to go out and keep supporting and keep arguing for the shit this motherfucker's doing and talking about. But, yeah. They included those participating in the DACA who, who Democrats in Congress are fighting for. See that? Like, this was the time that that was going on, so they want to make sure that who, whoever's a Democrat in Congress that's supporting positive, progressive DACA reform, should be voted against, should be had, should, Republicans should have, and you know, you know, you know, pretty much what I'm doing here for the progress of minorities in America, that's what they're doing for the progress of already rich, rich white people, for, for the progress of white supremacy, you know what I mean? And I, I, I don't care where anybody stand on the political spectrum, white supremacy is bullshit, white supremacy is fucked up. That shit should be done, like Bob Marley said, until the day when the philosophy that holds one way superior and another inferior is eradicated. There will always be this infighting. She cited an, an example of a Maryland DACA recipient charged with the gang activity who urged pals in El Salvador to take advantage of, of Obama's policies. One MS-13 clique leader in Frederick, Maryland, who had received, see, why well, you got a reference Frederick, Maryland, though? Because you know Frederick, Maryland is so close to Southern Maryland that, like, it's easier f for you to target Republicans in Maryland down in that part, right? Who had received a darker work permit and was employed as a custodian at a middle school in Frederick, Maryland, and who was recently incarcerated for various gang-related crimes, reportedly was told by gang leaders in El Salvador to take advantage of the lenient policies on USCs to bring in new recruits, knowing that they will be allowed to resettle in the area with few questions asked. Several of these unaccompanied minors now have been arrested and incarcerated for various crimes, including a vicious random attack on a sheriff deputy in 2015. Hold up, let me ask you, man. It's been like months. We ain't heard about all those kids being separated from their families, locked up in those Walmarts. What's happening with them? It's like those girls that were kidnapped by Boko Haram in Nigeria. We still ain't heard about those girls, man. Like, yes. Crime, torture, and theft are the trademarks of the gangs. 
The MS-13 members identify in the cases we found were accused of very, of very serious crimes, including 207 murders. More than 100 were accused of conspiracy, racketeering, and dozens of others were charged with drug trafficking, sex trafficking, attempted murder, sexual assault, and extortion, said the report. Vaughn is the Senate's policy director. The report noted the difficulty in seizing and deporting some of these involved because the crimes occurred in many of the 300 sanctuary regions in the nation that don't cooperate with ICE. That's a lie. Those supposed sanctuary regions that he's talking about, they do cooperate with ICE, but they just don't sit there and let ICE come get somebody who's not supposed to be, coming, who's not supposed to be getting got. If it's somebody that's not supposed to be there, ICE will come get them. Those cities will not in intervene at all. You know what I mean? But you don't care about that because all you care about is hearing the buzzwords that, that he needs. You know what I mean? Like ICE, Sanctuary City, Obama, Illegals, DACA, Obama, ICE, Sanctuary City, MS-13, Obama, Sanctuary City, Kamala, Ob Obama. You know what I mean? Like just 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 as buzzwords. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 not hard to it's not hard to sound smart to a dumb person. Yeah. I sound dumb to dumb people because I'm that smart. Fuck you, Trump. Yeah, I said it. The proliferation of sanctuaries may complicate disruption of MS-13, said the report. Many of the hotbeds of MS-13 activities are also places where local officials have adopted sanctuary policies. Hear that code word again, sanctuary. These policies prevent ICE from working effectively with law enforcement with local law enforcement agencies. There are approximately 300 sanctuary jurisdictions in the country, and they include municipalities, counties, and states. 11, uh, about half of the MS-13 arrests in our cases occurred in sanctuary jurisdictions. Paul Bedard, the Washington Examiner's Washington Secrets columnist, can be contacted as such as such as such as such as such. Yeah, I just had to do that real quick. Yo, Michael Shannon, I, you the man, bro. This was from the Huffington Post on August the 20th of 2018. It is titled, it is by Ed Mazza. It is titled, Michael Shannon explains why he'd never played that fucking guy Trump. And that's a quote from him. The fucking guy doesn't even know what's in the Constitution. He doesn't have any grasp of history or politics or law or anything. Y'all yeah, know who I'm talking about. Michael Shannon. It, the guy who's on, uh, who's, who's about to be on uh, Little Drum Ago. The guy on Boardwalk Empire and a bunch of other things. Actor Michael Shannon frequently plays a villain on the big screen. But there's one role the two-time Oscar nominee would not take. Shannon told Playboy magazine he would never portray, quote, that fucking guy, President Dump Trump. Just to get inside his head, interview Eric Spitznagel reported. You talk about being fascinated with bad men who are suffering. But Shannon, who played Zad in Man of Steel, Nelson Van Alden in HBO's Boardwalk Empire, and Colonel Richard Strickland in The Shape of Water, said Trump wasn't suffering. He's having a blast, Shannon said. Are you fucking kidding me? The guy is having so much fun. Yeah, never laugh. You see, that's why. You see, this is a white guy who recognized another racist white guy for what that racist white guy is. You know what I mean? Thanks, Mike. Thanks for that interview. Now I can help people see what the fuck everybody else be trying to tell them this whole time about this fucking idiot. He's having a blast, Shannon said. Are you fucking kidding me? This guy is having so much fun. In fact, Shannon said Trump was having the time of his fucking life. He doesn't even have to work. All the hard work that most people have to do to get to be president of the United States, he just skipped all that. The fucking guy doesn't even know what's in the Constitution. He doesn't have any grasp of history or politics or law or anything. He's just blindfolded, throwing darts at the side of a bus. Shannon said Trump wasn't capable of deep, deep, deep reflection in any form. So you ain't never lie about that. If, if y'all wondering why I always have my TV, like, because for the first time ever, I can attest, I couldn't even say this about Bush because as much as I thought Bush was an awful president, he wasn't, he wasn't an idiot like this guy, even though Nostradamus supposedly tried to Bush the village idiot, but still, you know. 
Like, for the first time, I can guarantee I'm an avid reader. I read anyway, you know what I mean? But I could have never said the President of the United States, the last two minus this one, the last two before this one, were now readers. I could have never said I've read more than they have within a month span or within a year span. But I can quietly do the a test. Even if I even if I go a week right now and I read anything for the rest of the year, I can I can choose not to read nothing for the rest of the year. I've still read more in this year than this dumbass I've read in the last decade. Not even the books he's he's supposedly published that were ghost written by somebody else. In fact, Shannon said Trump was having the time of his fucking life. He doesn't even have to walk. All the hard work that most people have to do to get to be president of the United States, he just skipped all of that because he took advantage of the racist opportunity that was boiling in people's hearts. Look at my boy, Shad Moss. Bow, wow, wow, yippee, yo, yippee. Man, I cannot believe Bow Wow finally look like a grown man. It's like, now let me stop. Hey, let me stop, Bow. Yo, you know what I mean? So I grew up, I grew up on you, you know what I mean? Like Mike, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, man. You know, we grew up where you were, that little, little Bow Wow coming up, you know what I mean? I was, I was a little Bow Wow like you was, you know what I mean? But you, the difference was you was making paper, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. The fucking guy doesn't even know what's in the Constitution. He doesn't have any grasp of history or politics or law or anything. He's just blindfolded, throwing darts at the side of a bus. Shannon said Trump wasn't capable of deep reflection in any form. It doesn't happen, he said. Fuck that guy. When he's alone with his thoughts, he's not capable of anything more complex than I want some pussy and a cheeseburger. Maybe my wife will blow me if I tell her she's pretty. <laughs> Mike, you killed me. <laughs> this dog killed him. Yo, he said, "Fuck that guy." When he's alone with his with his thoughts, he's not capable of anything more complex than quote, "I want some pussy and a cheeseburger." Maybe my wife will blow me if I tell her she's pretty. And remember, her name is not Melody; it's Melania. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, like. Yo, Mike, thank you, bro. Yes, sir. Thanks, dog. I just made you a honorary African for the next hour. I don't know how you're going to take it, but still, you know, she got me sweating up in this motherfucker. After joking that he will play national security advisor John Bolton in a Trump movie because of his mustache, Shannon said he hoped no such film was ever made, not even one critical of the administration. My preference will be that it just fade into non-existence, Shannon said. I wouldn't want to memorialize it or celebrate it in any way. Shannon, who was nominated for Best Supporting Actor in 2009's Revolutionary Road and 2016's Nocturnal Animals, has similar, was similarly dismissive when asked about Trump voters. Somebody who thinks Trump is doing a good job, there's no conversation to have with that person. Thank you. He said, I know they say you should reach across the aisle and all that crap, but to me, it feels like putting your hand in the fan. Shannon has shared having harsh comments about Trump voters in the past. Shortly after the 2016 election, he noted that many of the Trumps of the president's supporters were older. No offense to the seniors out there. My mom's a senior citizen, Shannon told Metro News. But if you're voting for, for, for Trump, it's time for the urn. When the interviewer said he was struggling to talk to his own parents who voted for Trump, Shannon offered some pretty blunt ad advice. Fuck him, he said. You're an orphan now. Don't go home. Don't go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Don't talk to them at all. Silence speaks volumes. Shannon's latest remarks in the September-October edition of Playboy has not yet been published online, but except posted on Twitter received almost as much praise as his acting. Yo. That's the only reason why. I selected this as part of what I wanted to read because that shit is just awesome, yeah. That shit is just awesome as fuck. That shit is just awesome. 
Okay. This was from the hill.com. This was, what, three days ago? Four days ago? The hill.com. Kagan warns the Supreme Court may not have a swing vote anymore on October the 5th of 2018 by Justin Wise. Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan on Friday said Friday she fears the High Court may lack a justice going forward who will serve as a swing vote on cases speaking hours after President Trump's second nominee Brett Kavanaugh secured enough votes to be confirmed. Kagan said at a, news, at a conference for women at Princeton University that over the past three decades, starting with Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and continuing with Justice Anthony Kennedy, that there was a figure on the bench who found the center of people couldn't predict in that sort of way. That's done. Lil Wayne and Guns, huh? What up, Weezy? You happy now? We got a real nigga up in the up in the White House now. How happy are you? Black president did nothing, right? A little puny little self. It's not so clear that I think going forward that that sort of middle position. It's not so clear whether we'll have it. Kagan said, "All of us needs to be aware of that." every single one of us, and to realize how precious the court's legitimacy is, she added. It's an incredibly important thing for the court to guard is this reputation of being impartial, being neutral, and not being, being simply an extension of a terribly polarizing process. Kagan, an appointee of former President Obama, spoke Friday alongside fellow Justice Sonia Sotomayor, S S Sotomayor who also hails from the Supreme Court's legal liberal black. Her comments came hours after it became clear that Kavanaugh Trump's pick to succeed the retiring Kennedy had enough votes to be confirmed. Kennedy cast a decided vote on several high-profile cases before the Supreme Court, and his retirement announcement earlier this year left many on the left voicing concerns that the court would lack a swing vote going forward. The Senate voted earlier Friday to end debate on Kavanaugh's nominee, setting up a final vote for his nomination. Susan Collins, Republican main, announced Friday that she will vote for Kavanaugh, giving him enough vote to get confirmed. Joe Manson, who was running for re-election this year, and the Trump one, but also said he was vote. So, yeah, there are not enough Democrats in West Virginia, though, for me to say go vote for anybody running against Joe Manson. You know what I mean? He just helped put a rapist on the Supreme Court. The announcement came after, uh, about a week after Kavanaugh and Christian, Christian Blasi Ford, his first accuser, testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee regarding Ford's claim. Uh, blah, 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 blah. This was from April the 8th of 2018 by Jonathan Cohn. It was on HuffingtonPost.com. It says, Trump care is coming to Iowa and your state may be next. Republicans have other options, but they keep refusing to try them. Republicans could now repeal the Affordable Care Act last year, and they seem unlikely to try again anytime soon. Let me see what they're talking about, my boy Wayne, about. Check out what happened as soon as in the seconds after someone yelled, shots fired. stories 
I'm sorry. The only reason why I'm sitting here watching TMZ because that's how I get I get my pop culture news now. You know what I mean? I, I I don't follow with the magazines and the music like I like I used to when I was uh, like 10, 12 years ago or so. But I trust TMZ because they have a lawyer wanting things. He knows how to stay within the within the law. You know what I mean? And he makes sure shit is right. And if it ain't right, they 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 all they 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 put out a retraction, they put out a correction. So I'm just saying I know celebrities don't don't trust CMZ because CMZ go at the truth. Like Trump don't trust the actual truth media because they go after the truth for that. Republicans could now repeal the Affordable Care Act last year, and they seem unlikely to try again anytime soon. But they are finding places where, through a combination of new state laws and new federal regulations, they can transform Obamacare's health insurance market into something more to their liking. Namely, markets full of cheaper, less generous plans available to people in good health. This week, Iowa became, God damn, what the fuck, it always got to be Iowa, yeah? If it ain't Iowa, it's Kentucky. If it ain't Kentucky, it's Virginia. If it ain't Virginia, it's Florida. If it ain't Florida, it's Mississippi. If it's not Mississippi, it's Alabama. If it's not Alabama, it's Georgia. What the hell? I need to cut that shit out. Go ahead, man. This week, Iowa became one of those places. Kim Reynolds, the state's Republican governor, signed a law Monday allowing the Iowa Farm Bureau to sell health plans that, in most respects, look and operate like any other insurance policy. Well Mark, the state's affiliate of Blue Cross Blue Shield, will administer the new policies. But the legislation declares that the new plans shall not be deemed to be insurance, and there is a reason for that. Iowa's lawmakers want to make sure the policies are not subject to the Affordable Care Act insurance re regulation, including those that protect people with pre-existing conditions. Unless a court challenge gets in the way, Nothing will stop the Farm Bureau and Wellmark from jacking up premiums on people with conditions such as cancer and diabetes, or denying those people coverage altogether. Nor will anything keep the plan sponsors from limiting or excluding benefits Obamacare considered essential, a list that includes treatment for mental illness, maternity care, and prescription drugs. Obamacare was great for the country, yeah. The only people he was taking more money out of was people making over 400000 a year. So, yeah, most of those old farts and, 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 and those young idiots who voted for Trump ain't making that much a year. Yeah, not. So, don't try to act like you are. See, if it wasn't for, not for TMZ, I, I would have never known that Taylor Swift is getting political. It reminds me of when Britney Spears went political and told all her fans to just go along with President Bush because the country needed a strong leader and the strong leader was going to take us to war at that time. So, you know, I, I cannot pinpoint exactly where, where that came from, but it was a Britney, it was a Britney Spears interview after 9-11 because the whole country was behind Bush. I mean, we did a strong leader, you got to go to war, weapons of mass destruction, all that good shit. Guns and, guns and Jesus. Mm. And if the Farm Bureau and Wellmark want to impose annual or lifetime limits on benefits, they can do that too. People who receive organ, plants, organ transplants or have rare gen genetic disorders such, such as hemophilia frequently want bills that exceed those limits. So far, officials from the Farm Bureau and Wellmark have not specified exactly how much of this leeway they plan to use. But they have said that the policies will look like the ones that were, uh, that were available before the, uh, the Affordable Care Act took effect. Those plans, those plans had substantially lower premiums precisely because they were not available or terribly useful to people with serious medical problems. We do know 
that this may not be a solution for all, a Farm Bureau spokesman consulted to the Des Moines Register. How Obamacare unfolded in Iowa. Although the legislation supporters don't typically advertise their downside, the more candid ones acknowledge it. They argue it is a necessary trade-off because premiums for Iowans who buy coverage on their own rather than through employers have increased to the point that many simply cannot afford it today. Okay, first of all, if you, if you, buy, if you buy insurance coverage on your own, most likely from my limited 20-year experience, most likely you're in a position to afford it without hurting you. No, that, that, you were one of those, you were part of the 2% in America. You're wealthy enough, it's okay. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that part right there. That's true. People with income below four times the poverty line or roughly 49000 for an individual qualifies for the Affordable Care Act tax credit. Those people represent the majority of people buying on their own, and for them, coverage tends to be within reach and sometimes even free, no matter how high premiums get. But the tax credits get smaller at higher incomes, and those who are above the subsidy threshold must pay full price. This is particularly rough on people in their 50s and 60s before, because even under the Affordable Care Act, insurers can charge older customers up to three times more than they charge younger ones. Iowa is a state where the differential is particularly striking. Y'all know it used to be a time where Shakey's, McDonald's, and KFC, all of them, they had signs that says, no color to welcome. Iowa is a state where the differential is particularly striking. A 55-year-old single is going to be voting for in the midterm elections. Your prayers have been answered. It's a little shady. She's a little bit country, she's a little bit pop. seen white folks turn against their kind like I saw them turn against the Dixie Chicks. Not this time.
Yo, you know what's so funny about that? Speaking of Taylor Swift, now I'm thinking about, about my boy Kanye. What up, Yeezy? Yeah, what up, yeah? It's so funny that Taylor Swift is stumping for Democrats right now, and Kanye is stumping for the dumbass in chief. <laughs> oh, it's like Chris Rock said, what's going on in America when the best rapper is white and the best golfer is black? Iowa is a state where the differential is particularly striking. A 55-year-old single man in Des Moines with an annual income of 35000 can get coverage through healthcare.gov and pay less than $700 in annual premium for it, thanks to the tax credits. A 55-year-old with an income of 55000 has to pay full price, which works out to more than $11,000 a year. $11,000 a year, you still got 44000 to play with. That's still more than the person who's making 35000 a year. I'm not saying it's, it's right, but it, it's, the law was, was put in place based on a model that Mitt Romney, as governor of Massachusetts, came up with from Massachusetts that was successful. Did you hear me there? The law that, that a Democratic president, a black Democratic president, put into place for, univ for some semblance of nationwide health care for the citizens of, of his nation that he was leader of. The model was based on what a Republican did for the state where he was a governor of and it was successful. And that Democratic president put aside partisan differences and saw that that was a good plan and wanted to implement it for the nation as a whole. So the backlash that's been going on against Obamacare for the better part of the last decade is, was never wanted. It wasn't wanted then, it wasn't wanted, it's not wanted today, it's not gonna be wanted tomorrow. It's just, it's just, I, I, like I say, man, shit would have been simpler if Barack Obama wasn't black, but we can't help that. We can't. He couldn't help that. You know, but. In public appearances and interviews with media outlets, including Huffington Post, GOP leaders have, report, have repeatedly blamed this situation on the design of the Affordable Care Act, with Reynolds calling it unaffordable, unsustainable, and unworkable. It's not just that the law's requirements have made insurance more expensive, Reynolds and her fellow Republicans say. It's that the high prices have driven healthy people out of the market, saddling insurers with big losses. Who cares if insurance companies lose some money? They've been making billions of dollars for the last hundred fucking years with nobody trying to rein them in. All of a sudden, one person is trying to rein them in, and it's a problem. Go ahead with that, man. And the sad thing about this is that minorities be buying into this shit, yo. Minorities be buying into this shit. Like, that's the shit I don't get. I don't get that. Is that the high prices have driven healthy people out of the market, selling insur insurers with big losses. The carriers have responded by raising premiums even higher or simply fleeing, which is why this year just one carrier, Minnesota-based Medica, offers policies to healthcare.gov. That is more or less how the market in Iowa has evolved. But the problems have at least as much to do with decisions by the state's political and business leaders as they do with the healthcare laws design. Republican Terry, B Terry Brandstad, Reynolds predecessor as governor, was another outspoken critic of Obamacare. His administration did virtually nothing to promote enrollment, even though, given the state's small size, adding just a few thousand people to the rolls could have made the market more, more stable. As of 2016, just 20% of Iowans eligible to get plan to healthcare.gov has signed up, according to figures compiled by the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. That was the lowest of any state, well below the national average of 40%. See that? Like, literally, if, if, 
I guarantee you, y'all, if Mitt Romney would have won, if the president that put out the Affordable Care Act was not black, I swear to God, the governor, Terry Branstad and Reynolds, both of them back to back, would have made sure that they promoted enrollment in, in Obamacare and then it would have been more than 20% of Iowans that would have enrolled in it. It wouldn't have gotten to this point where now they're saying all oh, healthy people are getting kicked out. It wouldn't have. They purposely chose not to go along with it because according to them, it's all about state rights. We got to reduce government regulation. That wasn't about regulation. That was about making sure people's lives and people people's lives are taken care of when they need health coverage. Like those numbers aren't simply a byproduct of poor outreach. An unusual large number of Iowans are holding on to grandfathered or transitional plans, policies that existed before the Affordable Care Act took effect and that remains cheap mainly because they originally enrolled people who were in relatively good health. As of last year, those holdover policies accounted for more than half the total market, according to estimates by Charles Garber, the Michigan-based policy analyst and proprietor of the website acasignups.net. The Obama administration is partly responsible for this. It gave state officials discretion over whether to allow the transitional plans and for how long. All right, okay, like, I got to clear up some here. I, yes, the Obama administration is partly responsible for that because it gave state officials discretion because it was so many senators and so many House of Representatives when their law was being signed. Who made, who made it a big issue to put language into the law that says that it will be left up to states to decide what's going to happen because Tea Party movement was all the rage back then at that time. Small government, states' rights, guns and guns. Sorry, guys. Sorry. If that was somebody from Habib's camp who would have told Connor, he would have called Tona that he is a fucking Catholic Irish rat, I bet she Connor would have jumped over and did the same thing. I guarantee you, just like somebody from Connor's camp looked at Habib after he had won and, and called him, you fucking Muslim rat. If it was somebody from Habib's camp who would have called Connor that, he would have done the same thing, jumped over, made a big deal about it, and the Nevada Commission would not have had to seize his pay. He would not have had to worry about no immigration issues, no visa being approved. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, hey, that is America. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not mad at it. But it's a lot of minorities in this country who have so much power over what can be done about little dumbass things like that moving forward. But you know, it's easy to just ignore because some racist white boy came out and said Mexicans are rapists and murderers. And you as a black person feel like he's right because you see, you got on the bus, you got on the train, you go to work, you see about six, seven Latinos that's working with you that got jobs that black folks used to have, but they did not force them out. They chose. Who, whoever decides to give up that job, they chose to give up that job. And whoever decides to apply for that job and get it and pick it up, chose to get that job and pick it up. You know, I'm, I'm just saying, man, you know, it's, it's a mental thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> the Obama administration is partly responsible for this. It gave state officials discretion over whether to allow the transitional plans and for how long. But Iowa is among the states where officials have made maximum use of their discretion. See? Like, they didn't have to make use of it, but they, they chose to because, according to them, ain't no law that no nigga gonna pass gonna apply to me or my people or my state. I, that's not me saying that. That's, that's their thought process. If you think I'm going too far, you, you ain't going too far enough yet in your mind. 
These motherfuckers that don't, don't put Trump in office, yo. If you think I'm going too far, you need to catch up. But Iowa is among the states where officials have made maximum use of that discretion. One reason may be the political power of Wellmark, the state's dominant insurer, which happens to operate the old plans. Enrollments in those old non-compliance plans were bound to dwindle eventually, as people found different sources of coverage, either through new jobs or perhaps reaching the age to qualify for Medicaid. Now that, now that isn't going to happen. Instead, a new class of cheap, non-compliant plans will be open to new enrollees. Now that isn't going to happen. Instead, a new class of cheap non-compliance non plans will be open to new enrollees. The policies will likely draw people in good health away from the policies available on healthcare.gov, driving premiums there even higher. It may or may not be sheer coincidence that Wellmark will operate the new plans too. <laughs> Iowans whose incomes qualify for the law's tax credits may not notice the difference. They will still be able to get comprehensive regulated policies through healthcare.gov, usually at lower prices. And Iowans with higher income, the ones who didn't get a tax credit, will discover they have a much cheaper alternative. Many will feel genuine, genuine relief, even if the plans don't provide as much coverage. But some Iowans have pre-existing conditions, which means they won't be able to buy the new plans. Others will sign up for a Farm Bureau Wellmark policy, get sick, and then require care that's beyond what the plan covers. They will be in trouble. And it doesn't have to be that way. How Iowa officials could have reacted but didn't. In Alaska and Minnesota, state officials face remarkably similar situations with premiums that put insurance out of reach for consumers who got little or no financial aid. They responded very di differently than their counterparts in Des Moines. They created reinsurance pools that reimburse carriers for their most expensive to cover beneficiaries. Premiums fell in both states and just this past week, officials in Wisconsin said they were going to try the same thing. See that? Like, Alaska and Minnesota are historically Republican states. They chose to put aside that little bit of policy different and recognize that that plan might be good for the citizens of the state. And they went along with it. They just did a little bit of a tweak to it. I get it. Obamacare wasn't perfect. It wasn't meant to be perfect. It was meant to be a start because the United States have never had such universal health care plans before. It was meant to be a start to be improved on. That's what America was about. But because it was a black president that put it forth, that's not something to be proved on. Like, the tribalism kicked in. Like, this motherfucker wasn't going to go along with that shit. I get the fuck, man. Iowa's GOP leaders could have tried some version of that. They also could have launched, finally, a serious outreach effort to boost enrollment. They these are places where there are opportunities to grow and, solid and consolidate the risk pool. Sarah Lueck, a senior policy analyst at the Progressive Center on Budgets and Policy Priorities think tank, told Huffington Post. Lueck, who, appeared, who happens to be an Iowa native, has studied the state closely and calls the outreach failure a huge missed opportunity. There were more ambitious options too, like opening up Medicaid to individual buyers or creating state tax credits to supplement the existing federal ones. These ideas, which have come up for discussions in other states, would have entailed their own trade-offs, including most likely additional government spending. That's true of reinsurance as well, but the sums will be relatively modest depending on the option, and all will live in place, and all will live in place these protections for pre-existing conditions. But preserving 
Those protections is not a priority for most Republicans at either the state or the federal level. They would prefer to reduce health insurance premiums by letting insurance cover fewer services and include people with serious medical problems. And they are trying their best to realize their vision or by example, encouraging enrollment in short duration insurance plans that are not subject to the Affordable Care Act requirements. As long as Obamacare remains on the books, millions of low and middle income individuals will, will continue to get comprehensive subsidized insurance they wouldn't have otherwise, and most likely have better access to care as a result. That's, that's especially true in states where leaders are more enthusiastic about making the program work. But in other parts of the country and for certain groups of people, buying health insurance is going to look a lot like it was before the, the Affordable Care Act. Cheap insurance will be available as long as you are healthy. And it will take care of you just fine, just as long as you stay healthy. Is by Jonathan Cohn, senior national correspondent for Huffington Post. Yeah, yeah, they weren't gonna do that. That wasn't gonna happen. They weren't gonna do that. That wasn't gonna happen. Let's see here. What's next? What's next? Americans are mistaken about who gets welfare. This again is from the Huffington Post by Arthur Delaney and Ariel Edwards Levy. It was updated on February the 5th of 2018. It was originally published that day too. It says, people significantly overestimate the number of African Americans benefiting from the largest programs. President Dump Truck and the Republicans in Congress may soon embark on a racially fought policy battle over welfare. That's another Fox News white supremacy code word, code phrase, welfare. Welfare queen, y'all remember that whole Reagan thing? You know. We can lift our citizens from welfare, from dependence to independence, and from poverty to prosperity, Dom Chong said in his State of the Union address last week. The latest signal that Republicans want to welfare reform this year. Trump has often pandered to racists among his supporters. He said Mexico sends rapists to the United States and that there were some fine people among the neo-Nazis who staged a deadly protest last year in Charlottesville, Virginia. When the president said Mexican heritage made it impossible for a judge to be fair, House Speaker Paul Ryan called it the textbook definition of racist. The word welfare is different. It's a standard political term that Democrats, Republicans, and journalists alike use, though Republicans use it the, more, the most often. There's nothing overtly racialized about welfare. You can even find it in the preamble of the United States Constitution. And yet, the word is often loaded with racial meaning. As a New Huffington Post YouGov survey shows, much of the public has a distorted view of which groups receive the bulk of assistance from government programs. 59% of Americans say, say either that most welfare recipients are black or that welfare recipiency is, among the, the, is about the same among black and white people. The numbers will reflect a, significantly, a significant overestimation of the number of black Americans benefiting from the largest programs. Medicare had more than 70 million beneficiaries in 2016, of whom 43% were white, 18% black, and 30% Hispanic. Really? I'm going to say that again. Medicaid had more than 70 million beneficiaries in 2016, and 43% of that 70 million was white. Only 18% was black and 30% Hispanic. Of the 43 million food stamp recipients last year, 36.2% 36 were white, 25.6% were black, and 17.2% 17, 17 were Hispanic, and 15.5% were unknown. So we're just going to drop those unknowns into the white bracket. So 15.5% and 36%. So what's that? About like 50, what's that like? 61%? Okay. 
So 62% of food stamp recipients were uh, white. Okay. Food stamps are formerly known as the as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program (SNAP). In one sense, Huffington Post survey asks an abstract question. The federal government doesn't want a program that is actually called welfare. The word can describe any instance of the government helping people or businesses, though it's most commonly used to describe programs that benefit the poor. These days, to Republican lawmakers, welfare means Medicaid food stamps and the temporary assistance for needy family programs, TANF. Paul Ryan and hardline conservatives in the House of Representatives said they had have said they want to make changes to these three programs this year under the banner of welfare reform. Historically, TANF is probably the program that has most frequently been called welfare, as it was created in the famous welfare reform of 1996. As a result of that program, uh, as a result of their reform, the program today is much smaller than its predecessor, aid to families with dependent children. And it, all, and it only served 2.7 million people in 2016. Of those, 36.9% were Hispanic, 27.6% were white, and 29.1% black. Meaning that if they, had to, if they had this particular program in mind, Huffington Post survey respondents who said the number of white and black beneficiaries uh, by the same were basically white. Survey respondents' estimation of who receives welfare track closely to the estimation of who gets food stamp. Nearly two-thirds of poll res respondents said of the program's recipients are mostly black or that there are as many black Americans as white Americans receiving benefits. Only 21% correctly said that there were more whites than black food stamp recipients. Across the programs, people overestimate the share of recipients who are black, said Elizabeth Lower Bach a senior analyst with the Center for Law and Social Policy. It is not surprising because we all know people's image of public benefits is driven by stereotype. Trump himself harbors mistaken views of who receives welfare benefits. Nah, his views are not mistaken. Nah, he knows. He knows. All those rallies, he goes to all those rallies, he see all them white folks. He can tell. He can tell who, who gets welfare, who gets food stamp. Oh, he can tell. He knows. He's not mistaken. He's a racist, so he ain't mistaken. Trump himself harbors mistaken views of who receives welfare benefits, according to a report by NBC News. During a meeting with members of the Congressional Black Caucus last March, one member of Congress told Trump that welfare cuts, which the president had programmed in his, uh, proposed in his budget, would harm her constituents, specifically that not all of them, specifying that not all of them were black. According to, to NBC News, Trump said, really? Then what are they? <sighs> Trump supporters are also more likely than Clinton voters to overestimate the share of welfare and public housing benefits that go to black recipients. The, per the perceptions of who benefits from programs may, may affect the favorability of the programs themselves. White Americans are more likely to support assistance to the poor than welfare, one 2014 study found. It's all about the wording, yeah? That's what I'm saying, man. People need to read, yeah? And another polling has shown that whites are 30 points likely to agree that average Americans have gotten less than they deserve, then they are to say the same about black Americans. See? White people see, when white people say the average American, they're not talking about black Americans. That's pretty much what that thing is saying. They're 30 times more likely to agree that the average American does not refer to the black American. Last year, House Republicans in Dump Trunk signaled they wanted reforms to food stamps, specifically in increased work requirements that would deny benefits to the sliver of SNAP and Medicaid recipients who are able-bodied but does not have jobs. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican Kentucky, suggested he didn't have much interest in pursuing major changes to safety net programs. 
You know why he doesn't have much interest in it? Because he knows most of his constituency in Kentucky, uh, these program recipients. He knows. Even without McConnell's support for a full-fledged reform of food stamps, Congress will definitely have to consider the $70 billion program later this year because it needs to be reauthorized. Last week, Trump and Ryan talked about workforce development in what might be a new euphemism for Ryan's long-standing goal of shrinking the federal safety net. Ryan reportedly told fellow Republicans at a GOP retreat in West Virginia last week that workforce development means getting people the skills and opportunity to get into the workforce. The Huffington Post YouGov poll consisted of 100 completed interviews conducted from January the 17th to the 18th among U.S. adults using a sample selected from YouGov's opt-in online panel to match the demographic and other characteristics of the adult U.S. population. Oh, that was interesting. That was interesting. That was interesting. That was quite interesting indeed. This is from Value Walk, value, V A L U E W A L K dot com, and it was from September, September the 16th of 2014. And it is titled, and it is titled The NCAA Racket $10 billion non profit organization. This was in 2014 now, so. If, if they were doing 10, if they were worth 10 billion dollars then, you know, I don't know how much they're going to be worth now. Mm. Let's see here. says the N NCAA racket, the $10 billion quote non-profit organization. It was published on September the 16th of 2014 by Guest Post. And the NCAA racket by Andrew Sirios, S-Y-R-I-O-S, and of the Ludwig von Mises, Ludwig von Mises Institute. Americans certainly love college sports, particularly football and basketball. After all, what is better than cheering on students' athletes comparing for the love of the game? Unfortunately, behind this facade, the National Collegiate Athletic Association and the University Athletic Programs are simultaneously running two seemingly diametrically opposed rackets, one taking advantage of the players and the other ostensibly giving them unfair benefits. The NCAA is a tax-exempt non-profit association that oversees the athletics of just under 1,300 universities. While the NCAA is not technically a government organization, it might as well be. It's a burdensome bureaucracy that regulates the athletics of public universities, which are substantially funded and strictly regulated by the government. And like any government, the NCAA regulates in an attempt to restrict competition. As Lawrence Kahn noted, most economists who have studied the NCAA view it as a cartel that attempts to produce rent 
by restricting outputs and limiting payments for inputs such as player compensation. And don't let the term non-profit fool you. Some non-profits can, can be quite profitable. Indeed, the NCAA reportedly agreed to a $10.8 billion 14-year contract with CBS and Turner Broadcasting to televise games. NCAA chairman Mark Emmett was, reward, was rewarded for his, for his efforts with a cool $1.7 million last year. And that's just scratching the surface of the massive government subsidized business known as college sports. It's not just the NCAA that makes out like a bandit, as Mark Edelman notes. The college sports industries generate $11 billion in annual revenues. 50, college, 50 colleges report annual revenues that exceed $50 million. Meanwhile, five colleges report annual revenues that exceed $100 million. Head football coaches at the 44 NCAA Bowl, Bowl Championship Series schools receive on average $2.1 million in salaries. The highest paid public employee in 40 of the 50 U.S. states is the state's university head football or basketball coach. Wow. And this was four years ago, yeah. So you know that money don't went up. Mm. Yet somehow that's not enough and these colleges need to soak tuition paying college students and taxpayers alike. The college game isn't plagued with, with quite as much cronyism as the pros, where $32.2 billion in taxpayer money has been spent on stadiums. Still, most universities have to pull money from the students and taxpayers to subsidize their athletic programs. Greg Easterbrook notes that despite enormous revenues, only half a dozen college football teams are self-supported. For example, he notes, the state supported the University of Maryland charges each undergraduate $400 a year to subsidize the football team. University of Carl Berkeley recently finished a $474 million, $774 million stadium with most of their money coming from students and taxpayers. Various states also provide tax breaks and subsidies to the NCAA for various events. For example, Texas provided millions of dollars from a taxpayer supported trust fund to help host the NCAA Final Four in 2013. One would think that with $10 billion in revenue and massive support from various donors, these programs could actually turn a profit instead of leeching off taxpayer. And this shortfall is even more ridiculous when you consider the massive salaries of coaches and administrators. Nick Saban, for example, has a base salary of $5,545,852. Comes in a stark contrast with the players that make this industry profitable. During last year's NCAA tournament, UConn star Shabazz Napier complained that there were nights that I go to bed starving. In other words, state government, universities, and donors can spend on untold millions building ex extravagant facilities that would, that would make Marie Antoinette blush but cannot pay for a player's food. And then, to add insult to injury, the NCAA will suspend players for being given free tattoos or receiving $200 from a childhood friend or getting a $4,500 loan or giving out too many signatures. That was Johnny Manziel giving out signatures and the $4,000 loan. Yeah. It's also ridiculous that not long ago, offering a player a bagel with cream cheese violated NCAA regulations. Offering him the bagel was fine, as was the cream cheese, but offer both and you have crossed the line. Buried away in the NCAA's myriad of nonsensical rules was a stipulation that snacks could be provided to players, but meals could not be. Bagel equals a snack, bagel and cream cheese equals a meal. Got it? That rule was fortunately changed, but it highlights the degree of insanity required to suppress pain 
these players what the free market will bear. Indeed, the NCAA has a gargantuan 500-plus page manual for, of illogical and often un unenforceable rules. Not surprisingly, such rules haven't prevented universities from cheating to get the athletes they want to recruit. They want they so not surprisingly, such rules haven't prevented universities from cheating to get the athletes they recruit to qualify as student athletes, and thus the second racket. In what is almost certainly emblematic of an epidemic across the nation's colleges, the University of North Carolina was caught giving out some rather generous grades to its student athletes. The following time paper. The following term paper, which I will quote in its entirety, was awarded an A minus. On the evening of December, Rosa Park decided that she was going to sit in the white people section of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. During this time, blacks had to give up their seats to whites when more whites got on the bus. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Her and the bus driver began to talk and the conversation went like this. Let me have those four seats, said the bus driver. She didn't get up and told the bus driver that she was tired of giving up her seat to white people. I'm going to have you arrested, said the driver. You may do that, Rosa Park responded. Two white policemen came in and Rosa Park asked them, why, why do you all push us around? The police officer replied and said, I don't know, but the law is the law and you're under arrest. Yeah, that paper got an A minus in college. I don't know who the student was, but yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah. I can see how students like that end up being like this brands who can answer, who cannot articulate well in the in press conference after a win or loss. Or Odell Beckham who cannot do the same, you know. But hey, as long as you can count it, as long as you can count them zeros on the check, huh? I hear that. Other athletes at the North Car at, at the North Carolina, other athletes in North Carolina skipped even writing 146 word essays and simply attended fake classes to get their, their diplomas. Back in 2001, Georgia basketball coach Jim Havick was caught providing players with A's to classes they never attended. In 2007, approximately 20 Florida State football players were, uh, were involved in a cheating scandal, and now Notre Dame is investigating four of its athletes for academic fraud. I went to the University of Oregon, just where just after I graduated, Phil Knight bestowed on my alma, alma mater a $41.7 million, 37 37,000 square foot state-of-the-art glass and case monstrosity called the John E. Jacqua Center. It exists for almost the sole purpose of tutoring student athletes. Phil Knight can, of course, spend his money however he likes. But one might wonder why he would spend it on a building that can only be used by some 470 of the 20,000 plus University of Oregon students. And it becomes much more questionable when you learn that the University of Oregon spent $8.5 million out of the general fund from 2002 to 2010 to pay for athletic support to, at to student athletes. Such buildings are about the closest, the closest philanthropists like Phil Knight can come to, to just paying the players, which is probably why such lavish facilities are built in the first place. Still, such a massive expenditure for an academic center for student athletes is telling. Virtually every student offers ex extensive tutoring programs for its student athletes. The word tutor being used very loosely and borderline euphemistically, of course. Mike Abu wrote an enlightening piece for Vice magazine about his time at the University of Utah that echoes a similar scandal at the University of Minnesota as well as many of the rumors I've heard about what these tutors actually do. As he writes, for years I willingly did homework for a number of student athletes. The students would pay $10 for a slip 
from the tutoring center. They'd give me that slip at the end of each session and I'd turn it back into the tutoring center and wait for, and wait for my measly check. After a while, I started getting more and more requests from football players. Then one day, an, an offensive lineman caught straight to the chest. His tutoring slips were covered by his athletic scholarships, so the slips did not have any, monet any monetary value to him. Because of this, he was more than willing to give me three hours worth of tutoring sleep if I just do his homework. After all, it would take 15 minutes for me to do it myself versus the two hours it would take me to explain. I didn't even hesitate before saying yes. I did homework for, for guys like him all semester long. And did the coaches know about the cheating? How could they not? Yet, it's hard to blame the coaches and administrators for f trying to get around such academic requirements. What other choice do they have if they want to fill competitive teams? In fact, it's an absolute absurdity that the NCAA exp expects every college where the athlete is also capable of being a good college student. In 2012, 30% of Americans over the age of 25 had a bachelor's degree. Is athleticism so directly correlated with academic skill that every last college level athlete should, should fall in their 30%? Or shouldn't we expect that about 30% of athletes good enough to play in college should also be attending college? And that assumes too many people aren't going to college already, which they are. While this would seem that these candles go in opposite directions, they are really one in the same, and the latter makes the former much more outrageous. That's because many of these kids get, get next to nothing out of their scholarships, and very few make it to the next level. College sports, Nigel Hayes, your prime example, yo. College sports are the highlights of most of these individual careers, and the government subsidized monopolistic NCAA cartel has made it so they earn a grand total of zero dollars. If a free market actually existed for college athletes, the mere idea that players would not be paid is too ludicrous to even merit refutation. And somehow a bagel and cream cheese just doesn't seem to amount to a sufficient consolation price. Yo, this was my jam, yo. I ain't even gonna lie. This was my jam. Most deaf and Aretha, let's go. There you go, that's what I was looking for, my boy Josh Rosen. My boy Josh Rosen. It was so funny, Josh Rosen came out and, 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 and said something, he got really honest. He got super, super honest. I mean, mind you now, Josh Rosen is a Jewish white boy who grew up privileged. I'm not knocking him for that, you know what I mean? Like his father's like a cardiologist or some, 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 some doctor who makes six figures or more a year. I get it. You know what I mean? Josh Rosen did not have to worry about having to get a scholarship to go to college for him to play football, for him to get education. He was going to get that anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Josh Rosen does not have to worry about starving, going to bed hungry. He does not, worry, he does not have to worry about something as simple as buying a pair of tennis shoes. You know what I mean? So he was just being honest because nine times out of ten, that young college student saw, he probably saw some linemen, 
some 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 defensive players, some running backs, some wide receivers going through some things that he know he doesn't have to go through because he comes from a family that can afford it, and his his classmates come from families that cannot afford it. You know what I mean? And he decided to be honest about things, and he was absolutely right. But guess what though? The only person who came out and told Josh Rosen to shut that shit up, he doesn't know what he's talking about, was good old grandpappy Nick Saban. Nick Saban who goes to this player's family houses and do a little song and dance and get them to be cool, you know what I mean? Is he granddaddy of them all? It's like the cutting ball. Is he granddaddy of them all? He's a white granddaddy of them all. He got to make sure that the NCAA racket is continued. You know what I mean? I get it, Nick. You know what I mean? You gotta, you have to protect your investment. If I was making five million dollars a year, somebody come now trying to say something that's gonna cut into to my money, I, I come out and say something about it too. You know what I mean? I get it. You gotta protect your investment.